Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. No guests on the program today. It will be just me, my smiling self. Hope you had a great day out there today. God, I hope you were long on uh, GameStop yet again. I'll uh, get into that a little bit later on and talk about Elon Musk. I don't know if you saw it, but Elon Musk tweeted out about two or three minutes after the market closed and proceeded to vault. GameStop another 60% just off a tweet. It's ridiculous what's going on with that one. So we'll look at that later on during the show. I want to make sure I get to my topic du jour to start with. Again, shout out to everybody. Hello, uh, Les down in Cape Canaveral. Kenneth, Tomasina, Big Eb, Jerry, Pepe, and Richard as well. Hopefully the rest of the gang will be joining us here shortly. Um, Alan sent in a question a couple days ago that was... I actually was on a Friday afternoon. I didn't have a lot of time to get to it, but I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about it. Unfortunately, I didn't have time today to prepare a whole bunch of visual examples, so I might do some of that on the fly today. But it stems from a question all about tape reading, the art of tape reading. And, and I question, does it still work? You guys heard me the other day um, slamming a particular individual. I'm not going to mention his name because, you know, why, why bother? Don't, let's not stoop to that level. However... There is an individual on the East Coast, I believe he's out of White Plains, New York, and he has a school that he sets up and he still goes to these trade shows and is pitching how he can show you without question how to see exactly what Goldman Sachs is doing by reading a level two screen. Now the only people that would sign up for that or fall for that are people who have no idea how level two works or no idea what the order book looks like or how the markets work period basically he's that guy who's looking for that uh, sucker is born every minute kind of P.T. Barnum approach so what I will do today is talk a little about level two talk a little about tape reading its utility in today's market can you still do it is it worth your time and effort and hopefully give you guys some visual examples of it as we progress and it all stemmed from this question so Alan thank you so much for this one he says can you talk more about why level two and reading the tape is no longer something that provides edge what do futures traders do when they are trading intraday uh, can you go into spoofing algos and the things that makes it hard to read the tape these days and ways to get around them that's a hell of a show you asked for, Alan. I will do my best to uh, bring you as much information as I know about that. And, you know, I, I'll i be honest, I haven't followed the algorithm stuff too much. It's not really my area of interest. However, you can spot them. You can actually visually see them in the marketplace uh, by reading the time and sales, the ticker, and things like that. So as you guys uh, progress through today's show, feel free to type me questions. I will try to do my best to get to those as we go through. What I think might help is if you guys um, have questions, because sometimes you have great chat amongst yourselves. That is awesome. I love it. But I get lost sometimes reading the chat. If you just start your question off with like a couple question marks, just put like two or three question marks before your question. That way I'll know real quickly where to find those ones and that should help me out as well. Okay. So let's uh, start off talking about tape reading. And of course, the individual who made that famous, you can read all about that in this book here, which is The Reminiscence of a Stock Operator by Edwin Lefebvre. I obviously highly encourage everybody to read that book. I think it's fantastic. I think it's just a great story into the journey and psychology of trading. That said, that book was written in the late 1800s, early 1900s, right? So late 18, early 1900s. And it utilizes tape reading. And what tape reading was, was really just, it's a machine that looks a lot like, like these, the girls in the picture here, right? They're literally reading a ticker tape. It comes off this machine that looked like this. I know I didn't have time to prep the graphics, but these are stationed on the floor and this is just printing out quotations from the central exchange because for the most part, these were what were called bucket shops, right? The bucket shops were these small little, essentially gambling hubs is what they were and they were receiving quotes from the exchanges through things like the ticker. So what would happen is that ticker would get read, someone would read the quotation on the stock XYZ, they'd go up to a board and write down the quotation. And as the day went on, these quotations would be updated, but there was this slow manual labor type of process where first off it had to be entered into the ticker from the exchange, and then the ticker had to go all the way to uh, the different receivers of the ticker. They'd have to take it, read it, write on their board, and their gambling uh, patrons of the bucket shops, if you will, would make bets off of that. So if you had any sort of competitive advantage there, you know, you could make a good killing, especially if you could get the information faster than the ticker was getting out to these bucket shops. That's really how it originated. And what you can do with tickers, if you are skilled at it, 
is you can start to see behavioral patterns of the buyers and sellers in the marketplace. Now a comment just came through from FX Green that says the chart shows all the info. It does, it does, but I want, um, I want you to visualize something for me right here. If you're driving, don't do this exercise. If you're not driving, close your eyes and I want you to visualize a tattoo. Just close your eyes and, and picture a, a t any tattoo you want, right? It could be your, you know, your um, Bon Jovi tattoo you got in high school as a dare. It could be, uh, you know, the heart that you got on your butt cheek or the lower tramp stamp. I don't care what tattoo it is. Picture that tattoo. That tattoo is the price chart, right? That's the result of all the trades that happen. But as we dissect that and break it down even further, it's made up of small little pinpricks. That's all a tattoo is. One dot from a needle doesn't make a tattoo. Well, I guess it does, it makes a tattoo of a dot. But you start to string those together and it paints a much bigger picture. It's the time and sales, it's the transactions that make up those needle pokes. So that creates the picture. So while FX Green is correct, the chart does show all of the info on the chart. If we break it down to its finest, smallest component, which is the individual transaction, you might be able to more clearly see patterns form or where the buyers and sellers are stepping in because they might be relenting to move away from their price. And you can see that more clearly on the time and sales if you know what you're looking for. Certainly we could look at one minute or five minute or 10 minute charts and, and you know, we might overlook some of the smaller little details that a ticker would show us. Um, if, if it's an ES symbol tattoo, great. <laughs> if it's T plus E plus B equals R that we take a talk about with uh, Dr. Woody Johnson yesterday, that's great too. All right, so when we take a step back from the um, the big picture, or zoom in from the big picture to the smaller, that's where we find the, the transaction. So I set up a page here. Let me see if I can bring this up for you. There's that, I'll bring up my platform. So I, I tried to make this big so you guys could see it. Unfortunately, I don't have level two anymore. That, that should be a, an obvious clue um, as to why I, I don't really think it works much anymore because I don't even pay for level two. If it was that much of a competitive advantage, I would pay for it still. So what you're looking at here is an order book. This uh, colored, uh, chameleon kind of colored area on the left hand side of your screen, that's your bid and your ask. So for those that don't understand what that is, the left hand column here is all of the people buying the S&P 500 right now. This is S&P 500 futures because I can get the order book for that, but I don't have a, the order book for the NASDAQ or New York, so I won't be able to look up your Goldman Sachs or Microsoft or Tesla or anything like that. The left hand column just simply shows us three key pieces of information. Number one is who is the individual who's buying or, or using a limit order to buy at that point because everyone here on the left side are limit orders, meaning they have a specified price. So this top line, somebody is willing to pay $3,846 even for one contract. You see it's got size here of one. So they're telling you that they would like to buy one. Now on the CME, it's all gonna show up as CME. But when you look at the NASDAQ, you'll see different participants. You'll see GSEO, you'll see uh, ARCA, you'll see uh, EDGE, EDGX, right? You have these different electronic networks that are out there transacting in the marketplace. CME is a little bit different example, but don't worry, I can still convey the message here. So when we look at this uh, order book for the S&P, obviously we see all the buyers lining up here. Whoever wants to pay the most goes to the top, and that's this guy, 3846. Down below, you see somebody's at 3843.75 trying to buy 14 contracts. On the flip side, you see the ask, which is the sellers, all the people look, lining up to sell this specific thing. And whoever wants to sell it for the lowest price goes to the top. He's only selling one. So we, we get a sense, not really from a tape reading perspective, but just from a liquidity perspective, we can see who is buying or has an interest in buying and how much. Now, that said, all of that that you see on your screen could be a bold face lie. There are what are called reserve orders or iceberg, excuse me, or iceberg orders. So while we can look at that level two screen or order book is really what this is called, and you see that those top two participants here, uh, top one, two, three, four, the top four on the ask side, which I'm moving my cursor around, they're all showing you 100 shares or one, uh, sorry, 100 shares. They're showing you one contract that they would like to sell. Well, there might be thousands behind that, right? We don't know how many are behind it because it could be a reserve order or what's called an iceberg order. They are allowed on the CME. On the NASDAQ, they are allowed as well. So as soon as they introduce this ability to hide orders, 
tape reading changed a bit, right? It used to be that the numbers that you saw here was true, meaning uh, that 1,000 contract is bundled into one. No, this is only one contract, Batista. It's one contract. This is, doesn't take away zeros. This is just one contract. Um, you can, if you bring up the equity markets, I remove it down. I take out um, two zeros from it to make it easier to read, but this is on the futures market. So, you know, when you're looking at this right now, I, I should have the belief that if I bought at market one futures contract of the S&P 500 at 3846.50, a certain amount of transaction should happen. Right? What should happen is all of a sudden this guy disappears because he sells the one that he has for sale. Now all of a sudden this 3846.75, that moves to the top. And then right away you'll see a transaction for 3846.50, a size of one. That's what should happen under a normal market transaction. That's, that's what you would expect to happen. But what if, let me bring up a different screen here, see if I can bring this one up for you. Uh-uh, I can hide those. And let me go to, I think I have it on the guests. There we go. So here's the same screen. It's different prices because I just took a screenshot of it. But what if, what if your market looked like this? All right, you guys, can you see that all of a sudden it's it's, it's printing nothing but 384850s, right? You guys can see that? And of course, I'm making this illustration up here just as an example for us. But let's say that our time and sales look like this. Everybody with me? Notice all the time in sales, 38, 48, 50, all the way down. And you're looking at eight, nine, I mean, there's, there's uh, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 contracts here that somebody has sold at 38, 48.50. And there's, it shows 12 there, but I'm watching it and all these transactions are coming by. What does that tell you? This is where I feel the only advantage of reading the order book or tape reading really helps you nowadays. All right, we could even make this even a better situation. You want to make it ideal? Let me uh, let's do this, and I will really make this a perfect example. So, what what do you think that means to you guys? If you see all that happening, and gals, because we got ladies in the group here today. Um, so let's say it looked like that, right? Let's say you only saw at the at the bid side two contracts that someone wanted to buy at thirty eight forty eight fifty. What does it mean to you? I mean, come on, this, this, this is class time here. That tells you that wh for whatever reason, that individual who's sitting at 3848.50 is lying. How do I know that? It's a fact. They have to be lying. Because if they're sitting there with two contracts to buy and all of these transactions have hit him already, then he has a lot more behind the scenes. We don't know how much. It could be a million shares, but I don't know uh, the, the extent of his reserve, but I do know that he's showing you a one amount and you can tell by the transactions that he's lying because he's been hit a bunch of times. Does that make sense, everybody? I know it's a little confusing if you're not familiar with level two or order book or transactions, but I mean, that's the minutia of reading time and sales. That's the fine details there. So what I would use this for, um, and I don't usually see it too much in the futures. I don't think reserve orders are that big of a deal in the futures market. I think what they're really, it's a huge deal in the equity market. So what I would do if in a situation like this, if I saw this happening right here is, is pretty simple. Basically what it tells me is this individual, and I'm gonna do my best, I'm gonna highlight him. Let me put a box around it. Can I do this? I'll put a box around the individual that I'm really focusing on right now. And that's this guy here in the red box, okay? So maybe I can make that bigger. Eh. Oops, that just hides them all together. Okay, so that red box in the upper left-hand corner of the screen that you see, that individual, for whatever reason, they could be institution, they may have a massive uh, buyer that they're trying to fulfill the orders on, they are preventing it from falling, right? You guys all see that? Do you see that they're preventing it from falling? He's stopping it from going lower than 38, 48, 50, and that's what all those transactions mean. So if I see this, one way I combine this tape reading with technical analysis is I would simply bring up a, a shorter term time frame. I would go to, uh, well, Jerry, this stuff is actually legit. What I'm saying right now is real. You can do it. It's just really hard to find. It's very hard to do nowadays. Um, you know, it's certainly not the piece that's going to be the big driver of prices. I think the big driver of prices is obviously looking at the higher time frame charts, but. In this example that I've crafted for you, if you saw this, you've got a couple choices. You have to tell yourself, all right, number one, I'm gonna go look at a shorter term time frame chart, like a one minute chart. 
And if I can see dashed lines, meaning that it's not going below 38, 48, 50 in this picture, then I might really be consider buying here because for whatever reason, this guy in the red box is not letting it fall. I don't care why. I just need to know that they're holding it up. So what I would do is I'd come over here and I would probably buy at market at 38, 48, 75. I'd start buying contracts over there using this guy in whatever reserve order they have as a backstop for me. Now, should that guy at 38, 48, 50 leave and all of a sudden price starts to drop, I simply sell my contracts and get out. The point here is the time in sales, the tape reading, this is about as useful as it can get, right? You're not going to spot Goldman Sachs. You're not going to spot JP Morgan or any institution. You don't know who they are. You'll be spotting order flow through an electronic communication network. And that does give you a slight advantage, but, but who does it really give an advantage to? In my opinion, it gives an advantage to somebody who is sitting there like this, glued to their screen all day long. That short-term, very, very active intraday trader. Right? That's who benefits from something like this. Now, every now and again, you do find yourself a diamond in the rough. You find your Goldman Sachs who's just backstopping some stock from going down and you just jump in front of it and, and ride right in front of him as he pushes price back up. Because at a certain point, other institutions will realize this market's selling off or this security's been selling off and it just stopped here and someone stopped it. You know what? Let's go the other way. That's the nature of price movement, that ebb and, ebb and flow of price action. So to me, that is probably um, the only real use for tape reading and price action. Obviously, I am uh, a big fan of reading the charts. I think that's the better way to go. But if you are a short-term day trader and you are looking at level two, find something that is uh, not as active, meaning don't, don't focus on your SPY or the major ETS. Don't focus on Microsoft. Focus on something that might be more thinly traded and you'll start to see these guys and gals with reserve orders uh, disguising their intentions and you'll start to get a feel for how it moves and where it may potentially turn. Now you take that tape reading, the time and sales in conjunction with the order book, you line that up with your price charts and all of a sudden I think you have a recipe for uh, for day trading, you know, a much shorter term type of trading. Uh, personally, I don't like to do it much anymore because it's just very, very stressful. All right, what did I see here? Um, don't work that hard, just buy and... <laughs> Well, big of it, yeah, and you're right. It is a lot of work. I just wanted to cover that topic because there's been a lot of misconception about it. And for anybody who is ever thinking about signing up for this school on the East Coast, where the guy will tell you he can show you exactly how to read the ticker, the tape, and time and sales, and find out exactly where price is going, I hope that you just reach out your hand, extend your middle finger, and tell him to go take a hike. Forget it. It doesn't work. Certainly not to that extent that this guy is portraying. All right, what questions do you have for me on tape reading? Uh, Alan's not here today, unfortunately, because this was I kind of did the show for him. Um, I, we, we don't have to go too much more in depth on it, but tape reading, that's it. From my perspective, that's it. it do, I don't think it works anymore on the Jesse Livermore type of advantage because technology has leveled that playing field and we all have access to pretty much the same information. Tape reading back in the 1800s, early 1900s worked because you had people that were getting you information before your bucket shop, so you kind of knew where things were going. You were uh, jumping the gun. Um, FX Green says, short-term time frame show the same thing. They just look to the left, and I don't trust level two. Work back in eight and nine, but not anymore. I agree. Totally agree. Um, I think, it, well, it's evolved. So its utility back in eight, uh, 98, 99 was, I loved it. I actually really, really, really did loved it. It was my, my bread and butter back then because I could I could literally watch GSCO sit on my screen and just sit there and buy. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in front of you. right? It's the old phrase, uh, if you see an elephant running through the jungle, where do you want to be? I'm riding right behind him. Right? You're just going to clear that path for me, so there's no way I can compete with Goldman. That worked in the late 90s. It doesn't work today because Goldman now knows that I'm watching him and they're going to do other things to try to bluff and manipulate. Uh, there's a lot of tricks that go on in level two, but it's, it's a super detailed tattoo gun view where every transaction is critical and could give you clues about potential supply and demand zones or confirmed supply and demand zones, which I think is its better utility. Um, let's see. <laughs> We're not going to go into the VR in the adult industry medic. We're going to stay out. I'm just going to leave that one alone. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go out real quick. If you guys have any, if you have questions on it, send them on in because certainly tape reading, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer any of them. I want to go and talk a little bit about what happened out there today. Let me show you uh, what happened with GameStop today, which is just ridiculous. I mean, this is, I, I hope that everybody stays away from GameStop. I think it's just dangerous. Uh, here we go. So let me take some lines off. Here is GameStop on a daily chart. I, I really did not see it going back up to 145 today. It, it just completely ripped to the upside. And of course, this is um, what I think will now be the hot topic for the next month or two. Will not just be GameStop. It will be all those companies that I posted that have super high short interest, right? Super, super high short interest. Those are going to be susceptible. And if you're a hedge fund guy like this Citron, that guy's dead in the water. Um, there's a couple things I, I certainly want to point out here that are going to further exacerbate this problem for whoever is short on GameStop right now. So uh, obviously you guys can see the, the huge move up at GameStop. We looked at that yesterday. I actually thought yesterday, I mean, I was looking to, to buy some puts at 150 yesterday, and I did not. I just figured it was too risky for me. I don't want to take that kind of uh, uh, risk, and all of a sudden today it ripped up again. What I want to show you here is, yeah, $10 billion market cap. How? Who? <laughs> Who buys it anyway? Well, to be fair, there still is a market for it, but I'll be honest, I've gone into GameStop when I was looking for stuff at the beginning of quarantine, and I, I basically I scan an item in, in GameStop. It's great. I have this fantastic app on my phone that'll shop around and I'd see where I can get it cheaper. So I was in GameStop, and I forgot the game. It was, I forget what game it was. I got a few of them for my PlayStation. And I bought this game, and... I was looking at it at GameStop and it was like 65 bucks. And I just pulled up this app, scanned it, and it was like, oh, okay, you can get it for 45 on Amazon. So you tell me I can just go home and then I can get it for $20 cheaper delivered to my house tomorrow? Done. Why would I Why would I want to use GameStop? So unless they can beat Amazon's prices, to me, GameStop is dead. Regardless if people are using discs or not, they go in there for accessories and things like that. What will probably start to happen is they'll probably start to, uh, GameStop will probably turn into if I was their board of directors and CEOs, I would start doing more of there's games on one side and then there's gaming, meaning you can have gamers in there playing almost like an old arcade through GameStop. And then you can connect those and have competitions through all the GameStops around the world. To me, that would be a cool idea. Anyway, let me go back into, um, yeah, FX Green. Not only is it still around, but if you look at the valuation, it's unbelievable. I saw somebody's options trade. This guy bought uh, 800 call options 800 April call options for 31 cents, and now the, the position is worth $10 million. It's crazy what happened. Close that position out. <laughs> so here is the the GameStop chart. Uh, obviously, we know that there's this feud between Wall Street bets and, and um, a lot of hedge funds. Of course, short sellers out there getting annihilated. But what I think is, is ridiculous is what happened after hours. So I'm going to put a horizontal line right here after hours. We'll do drawing, put it in snap mode. And it closed today at 145.97. So I'm going to show you this right here. This is what Elon Musk tweeted out. Let's see. Elon Musk treated, tweeted this. Uh, let me refresh real quick. He may have tweeted out something else. This guy... He just, all he tweeted out was game stonk. All right, stonk is the new younger generation term for stock market. It's just stupid, but whatever, I don't know. Who cares? He tweeted this out uh, at one o'clock. So this is eight minutes after the market closed today. He just says game stonk. That's all he did. And look what happened. <laughs> this is just unbelievable. Let's go put this on a five minute time frame. Actually, I'm gonna put it on a one minute time frame. And I'll put it on 24 hours here so you guys can see the, the, the sheer insanity of it. See that line down there at the bottom? That's where it closed at, 145.97. And it reached all the way up to a high of $248. It ran 100 points off a freaking tweet from Elon Musk. Uh, it's unbelievable that it was 70% gain in an hour and three minutes all because Elon Musk tweeted out. That is the only reason this thing ran like that. It's just unbelievable um, that this happens. Now, you know, who knows where the end game is here. Obviously, my gut is telling me go out and buy all the puts that you can, but I'm not touching it. I'm going to stay away from this thing. I just don't think uh, it, it's a safe safe trade to be making. But you're seeing this happen in, in the other one as well. We talked about uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. It also had a huge update today and after hours. It's soaring. So, um, short sellers right now, it's a bad time to be a short seller. They're getting absolutely annihilated. But yeah, I wanted to bring that one up because there's a couple inherent problems that are going to happen here on GME. So 
when you're short something, there's a couple of things that can happen. The first thing that happens is if you start, it, let's say you're short GameStop and it starts to rally up. What happens is now your available equity is diminishing, right? Because you're losing. At a certain point, you'll get a margin call. Now there's all kinds of different margin calls, but let's just keep them general here and say a margin call is basically your broker saying, you don't have enough money in that account left to carry the minimum margin requirement. There's a certain percentage of the position that they're gonna want you to have. Once that happens, they'll receive a margin call. And a margin call generally is a period of time, it's usually a couple days, where you have this window of time to send in more money to fulfill the margin requirement. If you do not, they automatically close out your position or a portion of your position in order to pay you, in order to um, uh, cover the margin. What's gonna happen for Citron Research, who is short here, and other firms who have been heavily short uh, or short at all on Bed Bath & Beyond or Tesla or GameStop, is they're going to receive a margin call, which means what? Which means you will see more buying coming into this market, not because they want to buy it. These firms probably have no interest in buying whatsoever. They will be forced to because their broker will literally liquidate it for them, and that in turn pushes prices up even more. So that's that's the next step of fear that you have here for GameStop. Um, you know, my guess is, uh, let's bring it up to a daily, my guess is you could see a lot more upside here as margins and short positions get covered. You know, it's a very, it's not like it's the most heavily traded stock in the world. It's average wasn't that big. Let me add in volume here so you guys can see this one. Average to volume. If you go back here, um, it was trading. Uh, no, I didn't mean average to range. I meant volume. Sorry about that. Let's put an average volume here so you guys can see that. You know, back here it was trading, you know, 11 million shares a day. That's pretty good. You know, it's not too bad. And now you're trading at 160 million shares traded today. If he says, uh, if so, will, will this be the new trend to start squeezing? I think so. I think right now it is. And what's interesting is not only is it, it's not like it's a new thing, right? Short squeezing has been around a long time, but because of the, to me, the proliferation of internet, of these social media groups and kind of people uh, collectively on the internet, you can move markets much quicker, I, I believe, than you could before. Um, we saw it with President Trump's tweets. I mean, that was amazing how quickly he moved things. Now now you're seeing with Elon Musk. Gosh, just, just have an Elon Musk Twitter feed uh, access on your phone, and every time he says something like GameStonk, just, just buy it real quick, because you know you're going to get 20 30% rate of return in a period of minutes. Good news is it was after market closes, so, or after market was closed, but yeah, I think this is the trend, which is why I mentioned I posted the other day on my Twitter channel a list of the top seven stocks. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick, because I think it might be interesting just to look at those real quick. I'll bring up Twitter, and I'll bring up my own page, which is kind of narcissistic. Let me go, here it is. And I will bring it up, there's the list right there. It's just so if you guys wanna take a screenshot of that, you have, oops, sorry. Uh, you can take a screenshot of that one. You've got GameStop was at 138% short interest. That is unbelievable. I, I, I still don't know how you could possibly have more than 100%, meaning all the shares shorted. You have uh, Virgin Galactic, which is SPCE, AMC Holdings, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Ligand Pharmaceuticals, National Beverage, Football TV, SunPower, Tanger, Tanger Factory Outlet Centers. Well, that makes sense. Factory Outlet's not doing so hot. Accelerate Diagnostics, Tootsie Roll. Don't short Tootsie Roll. And then GoGo. -Go. Those are the top ones I saw. Most of those are above 50% short interest. So let me just run through the list here real quick just to have a, a little bit of fun and see how these are all doing. But I do think um, you will see this as the trend. I do think you'll see this happen a lot more. So let's, we obviously looked at GameStop. Let's look at SPCE which has a colossal um, valuation. Well, I mean, you're up 17% today, and this one has 81% share short. AMC, AMC has more than doubled in the past five days, right? AMC, if you go back to January 1st, was trading about a buck 90, and it's currently trading at uh, 496, around up to five bucks. So there's a bit, and look at the volume spikes, right? Volume spikes is, is the key here. And I think you're seeing almost all of this is gonna be because of the current feeling of buy these stocks and, and pump them to the upside. So let me go one more. Got a couple more here. Uh, we did Bed Bath & Beyond. LGND is the next one. That's Ligand Pharmaceuticals. Ligand Pharmaceuticals, uh, I would never short a drug stock, period. It doesn't matter what I think of it. I would never short a drug stock. It's again my numbers against my um, my, my trading plan. But it's gone from 100 to 160 in the past couple weeks. Fizz, uh, let's see how this one's fizzing out. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean all of these. basically. 
God, if you took this a couple days ago and just bought long everything on this list, you'd be doing pretty good. I actually, it was funny. Somebody commented on my Twitter feed. He goes, yeah, I bought everyone. I bought calls on every one of those stocks. <laughs> every one of them. <laughs> um, short squeezing, ask Tim Sykes. Yeah. You know what? I hope that he gets burned. I'm sorry. He, that guy's so arrogant and full of himself. It's ridiculous. Uh, SPWR. SunPower. Uh, SunPower has gone from 25. I'm really going since January 1st, guys. It's up 20 uh, from 25 bucks to 53. Yep. Um, SKT. God, every one of these is going to look phenomenal. Yeah. SKT has gone from 10 to 16. Tootsie Roll is on a massive move. Went from what 28 bucks to 38 bucks. And the last one here, GoGo. GoGo is probably up the least in all of this, but yes, I do believe that this is the trend. Uh, you'll probably see these companies really start to spike here, so be careful shorting anything that you feel might be. Um, I'm okay if you short things that are you feel are overbought, right? I'm okay with buying things you feel are overbought, but buying something because everyone's telling you it's a dog company, that's a problem. I think you need to go and do your own research and uh, you know, be careful with those ones. Let's see, what else? can the SEC stop short squeezing? No, no. You, you can't stop short squeezing because all short squeezing is is people going out there and buying. What's happening, I think, which makes this more challenging in a very different market environment than we've seen in, in other parts of my trading career, is the ability for information to disseminate very quickly, but also for us to s disseminate false information and create what Jim Cramer would say, foment. Uh, it's illegal to foment, which is creating a a false impression about something. And I, I believe that there's a lot of fomenting going on in the marketplace today. You know, Wall Street Bets was just creating a bunch of memes about GameStop. That's pretty much what they were doing. And all of a sudden, it just kind of caught on. And, and, you know, now everyone's pointing the finger at them saying, well, they're the ones that started it. No, they were just part of the group that probably saw something that was bizarre, which was 138% short interest. That's ridiculous. Um, you know, is that a struggling business? Is it a struggling industry? Sure. Is it is it dead in the water right now, like cruise lines? Like the reference there, see what I did? It's dead in the water. Um, no, I think it's still fun. Uh, fundamentals and technicals out the window for 2021? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think technicals, I think you're still looking at uh, the same way we have been forever, which is right now, not forever, uh, but the trend is your friend, right? That's really what technicals are saying. In this case, these companies have been going down for a long time and had some pretty significant downtrends. Those are reversed, and all of a sudden, they're just getting squeezed out. So I would give, it a, give them a couple weeks so we, we see the dust settle and it calm down a little bit, and then you might get a better sense of valuation of some of these stocks we just looked at. But um, right now, for these companies, fundamentals and technicals are out the window. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, last year was a bad year to be short, you know, and uh, I got I got smoked on my shorting on my big short I did, but there was a lot of shorter term stuff that I did shorting that I did okay on, so it balances out. And Brendan's right; he says there's no need to be short right now unless you think the markets are going to crash. Not correct, but crash. Well, even if you think they're going to correct, I think that there's a space for it. But you know, a correction is going to be what five ten percent. You know, we really need to see a much bigger confirmation because we've had a couple sell signals in the past couple of years that have triggered for me. And, you know, I'll jump all in. All of a sudden, it just comes ripping right back out. So it's all these false kind of sell offs. If you're waiting for a, uh, a major crash, well, you know, when when do you know the difference between a crash and just a correction or a slight sell off? I mean, if you're if you're if you're shorting after it's crashed, you're a loser. If you're shorting, just you're risking yourself getting stopped out because it could rally up. So, you know, you have to take a chance sometime. What else do I got? Um, there were some questions came through. AMC. Yeah, 34% all time. <laughs> yeah, AMC. It's funny. What was the other one? There was uh, Helio Mathis, HMNY. Oh, funny, a friend of mine was talking about this one for a while. Well, here you go. <laughs> this is the one that does movie pass. You're up 100% today. <laughs> I mean... But I mean, let's be honest. Who's who's gonna buy this company? Who wants to? Who wanted to buy Helio Mathis New uh, New York H M N Y, which is the one that does Movie Pass, you know, at point zero 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 six? It's less than one hundred. I mean, it's it's point zero six of a penny. It's ridiculous. And you know, today it's still less than it's one tenth of a penny today. But it was up over a hundred percent on the day. You know, these are, moves are gonna happen. But this isn't the type of trading I'm looking for or investing. Um, Merlin, I would say Greg M is right in saying trust your uh, watch 
the ten year treasury no yield. Yeah, well we have been. We've been we've been watching that quite a bit, especially Bill Addison on the program. I mean that's a that's a very important one. Let me see if I can bring it up here. I don't have it on Trade Station, but I can get it on Trading View. I had it up there. Um, that ten year yield's very critical, and it's been on this you know pretty significant move since April of last year. So let me go up here and add it in real quick. Uh, let's go ten year. It's funny when I get animated in here, guys. My dog always comes running by, ten year yield, and just stares at me. It's okay, buddy. I'm all right. Uh, let's see. Where is that? Uh, come on, government ten year yields. Okay. Take me a second just to bring this up, guys. All right, there it is. There's the 10 year, and I also have the 30 year on here. But here's the yield on the 10 year. You know, I'd be using that 1% as kind of a backstop, but you know, we, we've drawn this trend line in here. It's been on a very, very nice up move, right? It's been looking great here. Of course, the, the steeper this gets, the more that it starts to rise. And, and I do believe it will because, again, the Treasury is, is selling more and more 10 year and 30 years to service the debt. You know, they're going to have to pay a higher yield. And we've seen it go from 0.3, well, is it 0.39 or 3.8 back in March of last year? But if you go to April, August, we're, you know, at 50, 50 basis points. Well, we doubled since August. Now, it's pulling back a little bit over the last week or two. Um, but keep your eye on it. We did come into that area of supply. I do think you'll see this continue to move to the upsides. <laughs> if bond ETFs sell off, uncontrollably yields will spike. Yep. Yep, and, and you know we haven't seen that really happen with like TLT. <sighs> Oops, that's not the one I'm looking for. Where's it going? TLT. There you go. Um, you know it's been it hasn't been aggressive. It's just been slowly drifting down. And I do think you know if we talk about trends as your friend or the bend at the end, well that's probably going to continue. You know you probably see this 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 is the 20 year that we're looking at right now. Um, that's the price of the bonds. So you're seeing that drift down. That means those yields are moving up, and, and I see that trend continuing. All right, I Matic man, I I know Movie Pass is dead. I know it's dead, but it is up one hundred percent today. <laughs> Do I think Wall Street bets will be shut down? No, and they're just going to pop up somewhere else. I mean, all it is is a group of people talking about the markets. I don't I don't see that being a problem. I mean, there's tons and tons of of meetups and groups out there that are talking markets, and they just happen to get a bunch of the attention for it. So, if they did, they'll pop right back up somewhere else. <laughs> uh, maybe we should get Timothy Sykes on the program, right? Talk, let, let, let's get my audience uh, really entrenched and how to make sure you guys know how to short penny stocks. Yeah, because that's because that's safe. All right. Uh, what other questions are there? So if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to go to a listener question. And I had a couple of those, I believe. Where was that one? Oops. Um. All right, I'm going to go to this question from Jeff, which came in a couple days ago. Jeff said, Merlin, uh, when you can, please review the how much uh, how much money you should keep in any one brokerage account. I have a trade station, and I'm guessing a TD Ameritrade account. I'm looking for a third. How do you keep them straight and take advantage of them earning money? Do you trade them all? A little insight would be awesome. Thanks. Yes, I do trade all of them. Now, all the different accounts that I have are generally... Uh, marked, meaning that they're a specific type of trading investment. So most, some of them, not most, uh, some of them are specifically selling options and collecting premiums. Some, um, one in particular that I keep at Schwab is a pure gamble account, right? That's where I'm putting a lot of my my cannabis stocks, the individual companies I'm buying. Um, that is, you know, the, my like my Schwab one. Some of my Meritrade ones, those are going to be more active trading where I'll go in there and I'm doing most of the analysis on TradeStation. I'll just go to the executions over there. Um, so I'll do some swing trading on that one. But yes, I do mark them for a specific trading style and they're all active. The other side of your question here was, you know, how do you keep track of them all? Uh, spreadsheets work really well. I think that helps. <laughs> the, um, the challenge with it all is how much you keep in each one, right? And I think that part of that is about your trading discovery. What do you know about yourself? I mean, are you a real big risk taker? Are you good with money management? As soon as you find out where your strengths and weaknesses are, then I think it's it's clear how much money you should keep in each account. Obviously, the big overriding piece here is insurance and protection. So if you're with an Ameritrade or TradeStation or Schwab or whomever, you do get SIPC insurance up to 250000 So 
that's nice. Um, actually, I think SIPC is 500,000. FDIC insurance is um, 250,000. I don't like to let any account ever get over 250. That's just a, a number I've always had. So if anything ever gets close to that, I, I move it somewhere else. I, and I'd rather have them all split up just because I don't trust I just don't trust the institutions. I don't trust the banks. So I want to make sure that those things are separate. And if one of them shuts down, then I don't have all my eggs in that one basket. Uh, Pepe, I've got a local guy down here in Orange County who does my taxes. He's been doing, his dad's been doing my taxes since I started started day trading back in 98 uh, when I moved to Southern California. So gosh, 20, 22 years now that family's been doing my taxes. Um, so that's it, Jeff. That's pretty much it. I trade them all and you know, I keep track of them through a spreadsheet so I know where everything's at and you know it can be a little challenging when it comes tax time I do have to do a lot of legwork to, to pull all my accounts together at least to have all the numbers there and then I let my accountant plug all the numbers in hedge funds are getting destroyed by all of the inner yes isn't it great um, for those that are on the podcast Richard says hedge funds are getting destroyed by all the interest in short squeezing oh isn't it fun it's it's uh yeah great you know, it's, it's a recycling of the financial world. I'm not too worried about it. It will it is what it is. It's kind of fun to watch. I mean, luckily, I'm not involved with it because I don't want to get stung by being short, you know, GameStop or any of these. But I could easily jump in there and jump on the long wagon. But I don't know. It's just uh, not. It's, it's outside of my risk profile and it's just too risky for me. But, hey, if you guys want to have at it, be careful, though, because shorting stuff can be very, very dangerous. Um, will Vitalik insure me against my own stupidity or theft? <laughs> Well, he did against that uh, big Ethereum hack, right? He insured everybody. He rolled back the blockchain yeah, and recouped that one. So, But most likely that's not going to happen. All right, what time we got? Okay, wow. Time flies. Let me go to economic calendar here. I want to show you there's a bunch of stuff that happened today. Um, I probably didn't. I didn't even update this stuff. God, that's how lazy I have been. Tell you what, I'm moving so quickly, I didn't get a chance to bring everything up. So let me do this. Uh, I have a couple things here. That I want to go to. So here's uh, the earnings calendar for today. I'm just going to do this manually. Normally I put them in a spreadsheet and make it look all nice, but uh, I don't have the time. I'm waiting for my assistant, which I don't have. So here's what happened today. You've got Microsoft, GE, AMD, Verizon, Johnson Johnson, Lockheed Martin, and Starbucks all reporting earnings. You notice smiles abound. Every one of them beat earnings and by a fairly decent margin. Unfortunately, not everybody was up. You had Verizon beat earnings and they were down 3%. Lockheed Martin beat earnings. Actually, they came in line with earnings expectations. They were down almost 4%. And Starbucks, which beat earnings handily by about 10%, was down 1% on the day. And again, this is why it's so difficult to trade earnings because you don't know what they're going to say at that press conference. They don't know which way it's going to go. Now, for tomorrow on the earnings front, is the big day. This is the day we're all looking for. I have a feeling you're going to see a big market gap up uh, tomorrow. You'll probably see all these companies report earnings after market. And then on Thursday, big gap up. I'll probably be looking to short on Thursday morning, but we'll wait and see how these numbers pan out. But you've got some serious names. Apple, Facebook, Tesla, all reporting earnings after market close tomorrow, as well as LAM research. And then before the market opens, you have AT&T, uh, and Boeing reporting earnings. So that is a, the mother load of earnings tomorrow, especially Apple, Facebook, and Tesla. I, oh, oh, can I finally use my graphics? That's right. It's time for the popcorn trade of the day. Gosh, I feel like I should be doing this more often. The popcorn trade of the day, as we mentioned, is going to be Apple, Facebook, and Tesla, all those reporting after hours, so be careful. See, got to love that the great graphics that uh, Tim put together for us. So thank you, Tim, for doing these graphics for me. All right, back to my earnings calendar, and I will show you the economic calendar that happened out there today. There was a lot of chatter about the Case-Shiller Composite 20 Home Price Index. People talking about inflation not being an issue. Well, if you own a home, it's it's certainly one that you're loving, but it's getting kind of scary. I believe this is one of the highest gain readings in the um, Case-Shiller Composite 20 Home Price Index we've had in like 20-something years. 9.1% was the number that they came out with. That's basically talking year over year gains. That's And that's for 20 major metropolitan markets. I believe Phoenix was like 14%, Vegas was like six. So big moves up in the housing market, which of course is a great thing to help fuel a bubble. When you have your property value rise and all of a sudden that house you paid $600,000 for is worth 2 million and you go, you know what? I'm pulling out a huge equity line of credit and I'm gonna go buy a bunch of stuff because I can. And then all of a sudden it drops and you go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be on the hook for paying this. Could be a dangerous thing. But yeah, those are numbers that came out today. Uh, tomorrow, 
we have these numbers coming out. I'll zoom in for you. It's pretty good for the U.S. day, meaning with the announcement wise. You have durable goods orders, you have crude oil inventories, and then at 11 a.m., you have the FOMC statement of the Fed funds rate. No big expectation here with regards to the Fed funds rate. It's expected to stay right where it's at, about 25 basis points or lower, but really it's about their talk track after that. Where, where do they see things going? How's the economy doing? They'll talk a little bit about COVID, the vaccine, all that stuff, um, and t probably even drop you know hints about California and how we're finally getting out of this shelter at home place. So anyway, um, thought that that's your major piece for tomorrow. You also have retail sales coming out for Japan. And that's pretty much it for tomorrow for your earnings and economic calendar. Uh, as far as guests go, I don't have a guest for tomorrow either. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Let me know what you guys want me to talk about. Uh, let's see what you guys got. Uh, Merlin, what do you think the impact of the market will be if the governor goes with unrealized gains? Government goes unrealized gains, being subject to capital gains annually. Less long positions. Um... I don't know. I think that you'll, you'll probably see more active stuff, right? So I, I'm not sure that I even saw that going through as a proposal by our government. But the unrealized gains being subject to capital gains annually, um, I mean, it just simply changed the way that you track things. I don't know how big of an impact that would have. I don't think it'll make less long positions, um, you know, which you'll probably see as things being sold out and more window dressing on the side of retail investors at the end of the year as you're kind of uh, balancing things out. I don't see it being that major of a market disruptor. Okay, uh, that's it. I'm done. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. I, I realize that I'm at 47 after, and i got to go grab some of the sunshine before the next rain hits here. So anyway, thank you guys uh, for joining me today. hope you had a great show. hope you enjoyed it. hope you learned something, a little bit about the time and sales, tape reading, which, of course, uh, is is a mystery to many people. If you are being solicited by the school from the East Coast telling you they can read um, the tape and show you how to do exactly what Goldman Sachs is doing, please do me a favor. Just call them up. Give them a nice verbal slashing out and just walk away from it. Leave it alone. You can just watch price charts and do much, much better. All right, that's going to do it for me for today. I will see you guys tomorrow. I may have a guest, but I will uh, definitely see you guys here. Same time, same channel. Click that thumbs up. Share it. Comment. I'll see you guys tomorrow.